There are four major types of biomolecules you'll see in the cell. There are nucleic acids, peptides and proteins, carbohydrates, and lipids. So first, let's talk about nucleic acids. So if we have a typical cell, where will you find the nucleic acids? Well, we know DNA is made out of nucleic acids. So, and we know DNA is inside the nucleus. And we also know RNA, like mRNA, is made out of nucleic acids. And we'll see those in the cytoplasm. But what are these nucleic acids? Well, we can have DNA, a strand of DNA or a strand of RNA. So if we have a strand of DNA, it's made of these nucleic acids, which specifically look like this, which have a hydrogen on this particular carbon. However, we could also have a strand of RNA. So if it's a strand of RNA, it will also be made out of nucleic acids that look like this, but the only difference is this carbon has a hydroxyl. So whether it's a DNA strand or an RNA strand, they're pretty similar. The only difference is, is these, these particular, if, if these were all hydroxyls, this would be an RNA strand. If these were all hydrogens, it would be a DNA strand. But again, the point is they're made out of these nucleic acid components, which link up forming these phosphodiester linkages, forming a strand of DNA and RNA. But what is DNA? So let's say we have, we have these nucleic acids that make up this DNA strand. What is DNA? Well, it holds information based on which base pairs, which base pairs it has. It holds a nucleic acid sequence, and, and there's information in that sequence. And that the information in that sequence can be transcribed into a strand of RNA, specifically mRNA, which is now made out of these RNA components, these RNA nucleotides. But this R mRNA strand also has information in its base pairs, which can create a very specific protein. And this mRNA can be translated into a very specific protein with the help of tRNA and rRNA, which again are different types of RNA made out of these RNA nucleotides. But the, this is what nucleic acids are. The, the common types are DNA, we could have a DNA strand, or an RNA strand. And again, they hold information. And we know the typical paradigm is we have our, our DNA with our nucleic acid information. So, for example, maybe we have this gene with the very specific sequence of nucleic acids. We know this gene can be transcribed into mRNA with the very specific RNA sequence. And then that mRNA can be translated into a very specific protein based on these sequences, these nucleic acid sequences. Maybe this gene, this DNA gene, has a different sequence, which will create a different mRNA, which will create a different protein. But we know these nucleic acids essentially encode proteins, and they can create different peptides and proteins. And these proteins and peptides are extremely important. They're extremely versatile. If you're studying a paper and there's some molecules that with some weird complex name, it's probably a protein or a peptide. And these are very common and very versatile. So what are these peptides and proteins? Well, they're made out of these amino acid units. So these amino acids have a central carbon, then they have a carboxyl group, an amine group, and an R group. That's the general structure of an amino acid. So if you have a compound that has a center carbon, an amine, and a carboxyl, and then some kind of R group, it's probably an amino acid, amino acid. But these individual amino acids can link up forming these peptide bonds, forming these polypeptides. So again, this is a polypeptide. It's made out of these individual amino acids. And again, depending on the R group determines what kind of amino acid you have. And these R groups can be incredibly versatile. For example, maybe we have this amino acid. We know it's an amino acid because we have a center carbon, a carboxyl, and an amine. And then we have this R group. And then this is another amino acid. We know it's an amino acid because again, center carbon, carboxyl, one carbon away is a carboxyl, one atom away is an amine, and then we have our R group. So again, these are the general structures of amino acids. And we know we can have lots of different types of R groups. These R groups can be very versatile functional groups. And that's what gives peptides such great diversity, because all these amino acids will link up, forming this polypeptide with this, this backbone. But again, we have all these interesting R groups with these, with these versatile molecules and functional groups, which gives this protein such great diversity because of the diversity of all these different R groups.
And these proteins and peptides can be used for lots of different purposes. For example, most enzymes are made out of proteins and peptides. And we know enzymes are needed to catalyze chemical reactions. For example, we have these two chemicals reacting together, forming a product. This chemical reaction is catalyzed by an enzyme. And we know a cell is just a bag of a bunch of chemical reactions catalyzed by enzymes. And these enzymes are proteins. And we also have structural proteins like microtubules and actin, which give the cell structural integrity and which are made out of proteins. And we also have membrane proteins. For example, in our plasma membrane, we have membrane proteins like transporter proteins or receptors. So again, these peptides and proteins are extremely versatile. And again, you know this is a, a peptide because again, we see these amino acid residues. We see this was the original carbon, or maybe let's focus on, on this one. We see this amino acid residue because we see this was the center carbon, this was the amine group, this was the carboxyl group, and this was the R group. So we see this was an amino acid. This was originally an amino acid. And again, so, so when you see the structure, we know we see, we can point out these amino acid residues, so we know this is a protein. But again, so again, that, that's where proteins are. But we can also have carbohydrates, the, the third category, so carbohydrates. So again, carbohydrates can be linked to proteins, creating glycoproteins. But again, what are carbohydrates used for? Well, again, when I think of carbohydrates, I think of a carbons that are hydrated. And even with the structure, uh, the, the, the empirical formula of a carbohydrate, you see for every one carbon, there's one water essentially. And again, this, this formula isn't exactly precise, but usually we, we see this is a carbohydrate. How do we know it's a carbohydrate? Because each carbon, for one carbon, there's essentially, it's hydrated. It has an O, a hydrogen, and another hydrogen here. So again, that's why it's called a carbohydrate. Each carbon is hydrated. So when you see some kind of structure with this carbon backbone, where each carbon has some kind of hydroxyl, that's probably a carbohydrate. And again, every single carbon doesn't have to have a hydroxyl, just this general structure, you know, is a carbohydrate. And usually there's one carbon that's oxidized a little more that has a carbonyl. But again, we see this is a carbohydrate. And normally these carbohydrates go through a reaction where one of their carbons, their hydroxyl, this oxygen, essentially goes through an intramolecular reaction where the oxygen essentially nucleophilically attacks that oxidized carbonyl forming a bond. And when we do that, we form a bond, which would be this particular bond that was formed, forming this cyclic structure. So these carbohydrates form, normally form these cyclic structures that have this, this cycle where an oxygen is one of the atoms. So whenever you see some kind of molecule where you see the cyclic structure where most are carbons, but there's one oxygen, that's probably a carbohydrate. And we see that's why, because these carbohydrates have these carbon backbones, but normally one of the oxygens attack forming a cycle where one of the atoms are an oxygen. So again, this we see as a carbohydrate. So carbohydrates commonly go through these reactions forming these cy cyclic forms. So again, that's the that's a dead giveaway that it's a carbohydrate. So what do we do with these carbohydrates? Well, they can be used for lots of purposes. We can take proteins and add carbohydrates to give the pro to to finalize the protein's final structure, but these carbohydrates can also be used for energy. For example, we can take glucose and other carbohydrates and oxidize them through glycolysis and other processes. And when we, ox when we take these carbohydrates and oxidize them, we create ATP. And we know we need ATP to fuel all the energetic processes we need for life. So normally when you think carbohydrates, you should think of carbohydrates being oxidized to create ATP. And then when we car oxidize this carbohydrate to pyruvate, we do another quick reaction to form acetyl-CoA, which also gets oxidized to create ATP. But again, carbohydrates are a little more limited in their functions. Commonly, carbohydrates are oxidized to create ATP, but they can also serve structural, pro uh, structural uh, functions. For example, certain proteins need their carbohydrates to give them the right structure. So that's carbohydrates. So again, we see these proteins require these carbohydrates to give them the right structure, but we also take carbohydrates and oxidize them to create ATP. So we also have lipids. So what are lipids? Lipids don't have a very specific structure. The point is, if there's a molecule and if it's nonpolar, it's a lipid. That's what unifies all lipids. They're nonpolar. For example, nucleic acids, we had a very specific structure and proteins were made out of amino acids, but lipids are, as long as the molecule is nonpolar, it's a lipid. And the two common lipids you'll see are these free fatty acids.
These free fatty acids have a carboxyl head group and an aliphatic nonpolar tail group. And these free fatty acids can vary in how many carbons they have, and they can vary in how many double bonds they have. However, this general structure with the carboxyl head group and the nonpolar group, this is a free fatty acid. And again, it's a lipid because it's nonpolar. All these carbons are nonpolar. And another common lipid is cholesterol. And again, cholesterol is a lipid because it's nonpolar. We have a lot of these carbon-carbon bonds which aren't polar. And again, these cholesterol can be used for lots of purposes. We can take cholesterol to do modifications to create hormones. For example, steroid hormones and like, like aldosterone and cortisol and the sex hormones. We can also take cholesterol and with some help from the energy from the sun, convert that cholesterol into vitamin D, which is a vitamin. We need that for calcium homeostasis. We can also take cholesterol, do some modifications to create bile acids, which are needed to emulsify and absorb fats from our meal. But again, the point is, these are the common the biomolecules you'll see in the cell. And you can see combinations. For example, you can see lipoproteins. You can see proteins with lipid parts. You can see glycoproteins, proteins with carbohydrates, and, and nucleoproteins. And we can also see glycolipids, carbohydrates with lipid components. So, so we can see mixes, but these are the four common biomolecules. For example, let's say we had this compound. What is this? What is this? If we were to categorize this, what is this? Well, we see this is a lipid. These are nonpolar regions, so these are lipids. We see this was original a glycerol moiety, because again, we know glycerol, which is a carbohydrate, it has these carbons, which each carbon has had one of these hydroxyls. These hydroxyls have reacted, so they're not hydroxyls anymore, but this was a carbohydrate, because each carbon had oxygens and hydrogens was hydrated. Then again, this is just a phosphate group, and we see this was a peptide. How do we know this was a peptide? Well, let's look. Let's look at this residue. We see a center carbon, we see a carboxyl, and an amine group, and an R group. So this was an amino acid. And again, these, this R group won't just be an R, it'll be some functional group. But we see this was an amino acid residue. So again, in linking all these together, and then we see another amino acid and another amino acid all linked together. So we see this was a peptide. So, so, so that, that's what this would be. And again, maybe we had this structure, this compound. What is this? Well, again, remember, see this cycle where an oxygen, so we see this carbon ring where one of the atoms is an oxygen. That's a dead giveaway. This is a carbohydrate. And we explain why carbohydrates form these structures. So we see this is a carbohydrate. And you might see this part and think, hmm, is this an amino acid? Well, let's think about it. We have a center carbon, we have an amine group, and we have this. But this is not a carboxyl group. If this was an OH, this would be a carboxyl group, but this is just a carbon. So this is not an amino acid. Even if it's really close, it's just one atom away still it's not this is an amino acid so this isn't an amino acid or, or some kind of peptide so again so these the point is these carbohydrates can be modified to create these other parts but again we, we know this is a carbohydrate because we see this dead giveaway so the point is there are four major biomolecules you'll see in biochemistry and below i've linked a link on a video that goes into more detail on nucleic acids a link on a video that goes into great detail on peptides and then again a video that goes into detail on carbohydrates and a video that goes over everything you need to know about lipids for biochemistry in the mcat